evening. Um, as you can see, we have a very esteemed panel here. Uh, to my left, uh, your right. Uh, I do believe, before we get started, is it Aricella? Some, would you like to come up? She has some t-shirts she'd like to present to the panel. Thank you very much. question, what does it take to kind of not only move through our system, but what, what do I need to do if I want to get this job? What do I need to do if I need to graduate? What we do at community colleges is really help to train people to go into the community and be successful. And I brought individuals here this evening who are giving of their time, and their time is very valuable, to share with you what the real industry of Hollywood is like. And they all have a very unique story. Uh, and they also have some opportunities and information they want to share with you as students because the mission of community colleges is getting people out into the work world and out into the industry. So I thought I would bring part of the industry here with us tonight. So I want to thank all of these individuals of giving their time. I've had an opportunity to work with each and every one of them. And I'm sure as you'll be able to tell quite quickly, they're quite extraordinary. But they all have very unique stories and very non-traditional stories into how they came into their positions but they understand the importance of giving back to their communities, and so I really want to thank them for taking the time to be with us this evening. So, I'm going to start it off with um, actually uh, turning it over to Adele Wilson, who is Vice President for the Streetlights Organization. She's going to share a video with us, and uh, then we're going to get into the program. So, Adele. Uh, it's a short video, so... No, don't relax too much, no popcorn or anything. <laughs> Do you want to start with the video and then have me talk about the program? Okay, we'll, nice start, Can we yeah. start with the video? we'll start with the video. So Aaron, whenever you're ready, please roll. is to create ethnic diversity on television, film, and commercial sets. This training program actually takes you to a jobs in the industry are behind the camera. So when Streetlights was founded in 1992, um, Dorothy Thompson, she's the executive director, she founded the organization in the wake of the Los Angeles riots 
but it was because then she couldn't see any crew members that were not white on any of her commercial sets. And so all of us that work at Streetlights have come from the entertainment industry. Um, I've worked in front of and behind the camera a lot. And as a woman, that's one thing. It's, you know, I came from an era where there were not a lot of women behind the camera um, either. But to say that, we, that Street Life has been around for 20 years and there's still less than 5% diversity represented on sets, on commercials, um, is telling of how long it feels like it's going to take to get equality there. Streetlights, we train um, ethnic minorities to be entry-level production assistants. And at the end of the training, we guarantee job placement. And we help people find careers in the industry that are behind the camera. Like I said, most of the jobs in the industry are behind the camera, and they're, they're, they're not just jobs, there are careers. The folks you saw in our video um, are all graduates of Streetlights. And you met David, he's the one that, that uh, was our quote unquote hero character that you got to meet most of all. And the producer director, Nemo Mathenge, she's a documentary filmmaker and director. We've got many success stories, and all of them started as production assistants. It's the tra traditional way to start in the industry. Film school, not film school. Community college, four-year college, GED. Our goal is to increase diversity in the entertainment industry. And so I'm here to tell you that there are ways to get in the industry that you may not be aware of. There are careers in the industry that no one's ever told you about that you could have and you would be qualified for. And I would love to talk to you all about that if I get a chance to. So thanks for having me tonight. is Ty Granderson Jones, Rick Nahara, Tiffany Smith, David Lyons, Marilyn Bittner. They're all going to take an opportunity to share their story with you. No pictures? Um, so I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Mr. Jones, and we'll, we'll start with you. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm here to not so much share my uh, experience in the entertainment industry with you as a professional actor who writes and who is producing now, but more so to share my journey with you because I think it's just as important. Uh, you guys are at a stage of your life where the twists and turns and, and uh, vision in terms of where you have, you're headed, where you want to go, what you want to do, uh, can be confusing and, and influenced by energy that's really not to your advantage. There's a saying, uh, listen to your elders not so much because they're always right, but because they have more experience being wrong. Okay? Uh, when I was 16 years old, my father pushed me out of the house. I like to say that I left home at 16, but he pushed me out of the house and I came from a very good middle class, upper class family. So I didn't really have an excuse to get involved with criminal activity. Um, I was a very smart student. Uh, in high school, I was the first vice president of uh, student government um, that was ethnic. Uh, I was a state wrestling champ. I was a city kids Muay Thai champ. Um, I got along with everybody. I was very eclectic in terms of how I was able to move sociologically, which was my danger, which can be a positive. You know how to be eclectic and focus that energy. But um, I graduated with honors. I was smart, but I was still too smart for my own good. Uh, got involved with criminal activity and by the time I graduated from high school I uh, ended up uh, serving time and being incarcerated for almost two years. My father, who was very, very connected, which uh, is not the case for most that went down the path that I went, 
you know, uh, very politically connected. I have an expunged record. My father looked into my eyes and he said, that's it, son. I washed my hands. Nine times out of ten, you won't make it, but that's it. Uh, I'm glad he looked into my eyes and told me that because within two weeks, I, uh, I was already uh, accepted to college. Within two weeks, I found myself going to college at Florida State University and Florida a &M University as a co-op student. I got my BA in theater. Uh, moved on to New York City after meeting one of the great acting teachers that came to visit at Florida State University by the name of Lee Strasberg, who's a mentor of many great actors. Uh, graduated, went to New York, knocked on Mr. Strasberg's office door, ended up working with him, uh, and went on and moved out of New York on to the University of California, San Diego, and got my Master's of Fine Arts in acting. Never looked back, uh, found myself in Hollywood, which was always my dream, that I'd forgotten what my dream was when I was uh, at, the state, at the stage of the game where you guys are right now, pretty much, well, a little bit before. Uh, went on to Hollywood and found myself uh, from Hollywood to New York, having uh, done uh, over 65 plays, including... Uh, the Los Angeles premiere when it left Broadway in New York, August Wilson's Joe Turner's Come and Gone. I went on to star in a couple, and co-star in a couple of cult films, uh, CB4 with Chris Rock. I was 40 dog, and you know, most of you guys out there remember the guy with the movie bar, you know, uh, and uh, Con Air, um, and uh, you know, with several guest stars. And uh, so I'm here to tell you that it's about the choices you make um, and you don't have to go down a dark path to find yourself but I'm here to tell you whatever you're going through um, I'm here to grind it out still obviously I'm not Sam Jackson it's never easy it's a grind and it's always a fight and you gotta keep believing and um, my story is not exclusive um, it's not special, but it is blessed, and I'm here to share it with you. Thank you. Oh. By the way, um, it's also included my story, in, um, which I'll be signing these at the end of the evening. Of course, they aren't free. I'm sorry. I didn't publish it, but it's a Hollywood photo journal called Mugshots with the story, vaguely what I just told you, along with great actors that also have a, a story of redemption, uh, such as Eric Roberts, Danny Trejo, Clifton Collins, and so forth. Thanks. during it. 
Jacobs, he was like, you know, Rick, they, they'll keep us here longer if, if you write. And I was like, well, the pro process of improv is you say yes to everything. So I said, well, yes, I can write. And she goes, yes, I can write too. So we're just going to keep saying yes all the time. And uh, that, that was a great experience. And from there, I, I started writing. And I never called myself a writer. I was like, ah, I'm not a writer. Writers are nerdy guys with glasses and all that kind of thing. And get beat up in school a lot. And I didn't see myself as a writer. But I started writing and I plays because there wasn't any roles for Latinos in Hollywood when I started out. I, was, I did a movie with George Clooney called Red Surf. It was George Clooney and me, and I was the Cuban drug lord. Which, yeah, which is the highest form of drug lord you could ever do. <laughs> like, I'm not really a drug lord, so I was doing something really special. And uh, I remember thinking, no, I just can't play these roles because it's not that I don't know that world as I'm an actor to play anything, you know. But I said, the problem is no one's writing this stuff. And so I would meet writers and I'd go, I'd see shows, and there's never a Latino or most time, very few writers of color. And uh, I started writing, I joined the Warner Brothers writing program because my neighbor was John Wells, who created ER and, and all the shows. And so one day, my play started taking off, so I was getting royalties. We go to the, the mailbox, we both share the Hollywood Hills. And he goes, hey, why don't you write TV and stuff like that? Film. And I go, oh, come on, you know, and I, I'm an actor, I'm not a writer, so these are fun. So I saw your play, it was really good. And I saw, thanks. He said, uh, look at my residual checks. So he brought up his residual check, it's a green envelope. It's, when you're a writer, when you see those in the mailbox, you get all excited, because it's like opening <laughs> Christmas present. So he showed me his, and it was, uh, 20 grand or something like that. And I showed him mine, which is like $126. So I said, man, I'm joining the Warner Brothers writing program right now. So I did, and then I, I ended up in a show called In Living Color. And so, so I wrote that show, and that was a unique experience because it was the, the, the really cultural, at that moment, like the zeitgeist. It was, it was, I remember going through the riots myself, and I was at yeah. Yeah. Hire him. I am good. <laughs> the man to save my life. <laughs> so, does that work? Oh, it's wireless? Oh, thank God. Is that working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, I, I did in Living Color, and then from there I, I did a, a show called Culture Clash, and wrote that for Fox, and, and I started doing pilots, and, and I really s always thought that we're better off together than apart. And then the, the United States that I dreamed of and believed in was a one that was everyone was welcome. And you know, my father had been in Vietnam and World War II, and my uncle died in World War II, and all that stuff. And I was getting stopped at the border, the San Clemente border, <laughs> the checkpoint, because you know, I driving a bad car. Um, and I, I saw a lot of stuff. And, was, and the worst part is, I'm Leto, which, which is, for those that aren't Mexican, it means like good looking Latino man. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, I'm not sure. So, I would get these situations, and I, I was like, you know, if you tell your story, Whoopi told me that early on, because I was a kid, basically, working with her. And I, and I looked at Whoopi, and she would tell me stories. And uh, she would do her one, one two-person show. That's what it was. It wasn't a one-person show. But her partner kept dropping out, so she wanted that $50 at the Rotary Club to do her scenes, so she would make it a one-person show. And she was just so positive, and I, I remember that. And she kept saying, you're, you're right, you should write. So when you're a diverse person in Hollywood, and I, I've done films like Nothing Like the Holidays, and I had a show on Broadway called Latino Log, and all that stuff, when you're a diverse person in Hollywood, you have to do anything it is to survive. It's not like a, you know, I'm just gonna be a, you know, I, I wish it was that easy, uh, trust me. I mean, I would, uh, you can't, especially when you're diverse, you can't just be good. You gotta be great just to get a good job. You know, just to get that stuff. And it's very difficult. It's extremely difficult. I mean, it is so hard. I'm telling you now, 
don't expect it to be easy. But nothing that you really earn is going to be easy, mm -hmm. especially if you're a minority. I hate to say it, you know, it's just the way it's always been. And we're the first ones to know it. So I started working for CBS, which is, you know, Tiffany, Tiffany is, is the, the head of the program, diversity, which is great. And I've been there, what, seven years? Nine years? Dang. <laughs> I didn't know that. And this publicist also. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny. It, it's been, it's, it's, that is, in some ways, I'm very proud of that because, oh, I write, direct, I do the whole thing. I, I, we, with Fern Ornstein, who, who cast it and, and the help of CBS, we do a program that thousands audition for it. And we take maybe 24 actors and we have writers to do it. Of all those people, 16, 16 are now series regulars on TV, and two have gone on to Saturday Night Live. So there's, there is no better program in all the world that has done that. And so I'm very proud of that, and I'm proud of you know, CBS for, for encouraging and doing that. And, and that's what it's been. It's, it's great to mentor. That's the thing that's made me the most happiest. And my show, Latino Logs, has had over 150 actors Latino actors that have gone on the show. Everyone from Eugenio Derbez, Jaime Camille, uh, you know, Cheech Marin directed the show on Broadway. So the thing about being a writer and a producer is it uh, you make yourself a job. It's a white piece of paper. You gotta fill up every every time. And it's gotta always be good. So I I think it's it's been a, a, a great journey, and I think you guys are gonna have the experience of when you're young. You know, if I would have known how hard it was, I probably wouldn't have done it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> but I would have looked back and said, I wish someone would have warned me. <laughs> but you guys are young, and that is such a, a, your debit card is filled with hope and all these things. <laughs> Slide that card and go after your dreams. Because even if you go after a career in, in Hollywood or whatever, you may not end up in Hollywood. You may end up, you know, casting or not, not casting, but I'm saying you might end up in so many other different fields that are related to entertainment and part of entertainment. You know, I just did a, a campaign where I did a lot of commercials. It was a political campaign. And I was like, wow, now I'm trying some politics. And now I'm doing that. But you always got to say yes because that opens the door. And so if you say yes to an opportunity, you don't know where that will lead you. And, and that's what being here is about, mentoring and, and helping out. First of all, my, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I know you're probably in the midst of classes and everything, so thank you so much for taking your time with me. And as the fabulous Ms. Jamil said, I'm Tiffany Smith on Hawaii, and I'm the Vice President of Diversity and Communications for CBS Television, the network, and the studio, as well as Showtime, our cable sister. I have, I'm starting my 14th year at CBS at, at the top of the year, and I actually started out as a publicist, and it grew into one of the things that I noticed when I first walked in the door of being a publicist, I was the only person of color, of any color at all, <laughs> and diversity, it was right around that time, the 1999-2000 season, that all of the networks launched their fall shows and there was not one person of color in any of the shows on any of the networks. So it was something that I kind of, being the only person of color in the office, they would turn to me, what does this mean? What does this mean? You know, so I became an expert for anything of color. I, it wasn't just the black, it was anything at whatsoever. And after being a publicist for some time, Diversity has always, always been a passion of mine. Just I'm, I'm a native Angelino. I'm a proud graduate of Howard University in Washington, D.C. So, diversity has definitely been a part of my life just growing up. I think the transition happened in specifically, I mean, I know exactly what happened. My father passed away, and you kind of have an epiphany, if you will. What are you doing with your life? What do you really want to do? And I always say this quite often of, don't be afraid to ask. You'd be surprised how many times people actually say yes if you ask. Right. And I went into my boss's office one day, didn't even have an appointment. I walked in and I said, I really don't realize, I really don't think you realize how smart I am. I don't think you're utilizing me effectively. 
this diversity space is in dire, dire needs. And if anyone knows the CEO and president of CVS, Leslie Mundes, he's very competitive. And I said, we are not in the ballpark. You know, we're not tailgating. We are at home on the couch and the TV isn't on. We are not in this space whatsoever. And luckily, he, he was all ears. And the president, the now president of CBS, Nina Tassler, I was able to present my wishes to start a diversity program at CBS, entertainment-wise. And she said, we'd be stupid not to make this happen. So fast forward, two weeks after that, I was able to start the program, which includes not only our fabulous showcase directed by Rick DeHara, and, uh, but also our writing pro programs, our, our directing programs, mentorships. And one thing for you guys that I don't think any of us had back in the day was that thing called the internet, where you can easily, in your room, in the morning, before you go to bed, whatever it might be, look for internships, look for opportunities such as street lights, look for anything that is right there at your tips. It's not like you have to wait till the sun comes up and hit the pavement. You can always utilize those. Internships are invaluable in the sense that when I was in school, I was a broadcast journalism major. I thought I was going to be the next sports journalist on the air until I had an internship at CBS in D.C. And I realized I hated it. I was like, I don't want to do this. And so internships not only can tell you what you want to do, but they can also tell you what you don't want to do. So that's really amazing. And I really want to take your questions later on, so um, I'm going to wrap it up right now. Thanks. Hey everybody, my name is David Lyons. I am a location manager, and unfortunately not very diverse. But, uh, diversity. <laughs> absolutely, my crew. You can be a fan of diversity. That's big enough. fan, big fan. I married into diversity. <laughs> uh, she's Cuban, but not a drug lord. I, I'm, 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 I'm married to diversity too, but it's the white side. So. Oh, yeah. well, we should we should talk. Um, I grew up in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, with dreams of coming to Hollywood and doing something. I didn't know what. I really didn't see myself in front of the camera. I'm one of the vast majority of people that make up the behind the scenes. And what I do is, when you watch TV shows and movies and you see where they're doing what they're doing, I'm the guy that finds that and makes it legal and deals with neighbors that complain and a whole lot of things in Maryland could probably tell you about too. <laughs> um, but I started at uh, Kalamazoo Valley Community College and I got involved in a film program there and that led me to Michigan State University where I got a degree in telecommunications right about the time the internet was coming out making a telecommunications degree absolutely obsolete. <laughs> it's all so, I, mean. I, um, I moved to Los Angeles uh, almost exactly 10 years ago and just started looking for jobs and it's not easy. There's 200 people a day that moved to LA to try to do what what we do. And a lot of people you know, haven't been as fortunate as we have or haven't gotten as far as we have. And you really, you really have to work hard. You can't just go there and hope to be discovered at Schwab's Pharmacy like it's 1946. Um, you, gotta, you gotta work for it. And uh, luckily I was instilled with a very strong Midwestern work ethic that helped a lot and also a bit of luck, but my my first job was fetching coffee for some real pricks. <laughs> oh, uh, it's 18 and over, right? I, I thought I was cleaning it up. That's not bad. Uh, Rick already dropped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Focus, 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 focus. It's okay, it's all right. I meant Frank. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Frank. Um, but it's, um, it's been a really good time. I, I slowly worked my way up. Um, and now I'm a location manager, if that's what you aspire to be. I don't think anybody sets out to do that. But the vast majority of jobs out there are the, the behind the scenes one. And they are, I wouldn't call them glamorous, but they're just so rewarding. Uh, some days, I was at uh, Venice Boardwalk a couple days ago and I saw a sign, a guy holding a sign that said, kick me in the balls for $25. <laughs> and there are days, like today, where I felt like that at the end of my day. But there's other days when you get to come home and just talk about you know, the great people you work with. I was, I was in a, uh, a van with uh, Christopher Guest yesterday, 
improv um, I don't know if you're familiar with Best in Show and Spinal Tap and some really great things. And it's just so much fun. It's, it's really, really rewarding. But like I said, it isn't easy. Um, but you guys are in the program, you're here doing this, and it's a great place to start. And uh, I also look forward to your questions. I'm Marilyn Bittner, and I'm from Long Island, New York. And by the way, he's one of the best location managers in the business. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. And I went to George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And what that exposed me to was a very diverse student body. And then I went into, I graduated with a degree in philosophy, which is totally worthless. Um, it really is. You know, there aren't many jobs for philosopher king. But while I was at UW, because of where it was located, I became very involved in politics. And barely graduated because I spent so little time there. I know I shouldn't say that. But, um, but I went to work in presidential politics. Um, I worked for Ted Kennedy, I worked for Gary Hart, I worked for Bill Clinton, and it was great. This is, this is what my passion was. And it also exposed me to very diverse workplaces. When I, I, and I worked out here in California for, for Teddy and for Gary Hart and for Bill Clinton. Last job I had it was um, Deputy Political Director for the State of California for Bill Clinton. And I got, and in, in between those jobs, I worked in what they call above the line development, which means you come into your office every day and wait for rejection. <laughs> I thought I'd be a great producer if only I could produce the next Jack Nicholson movie. Didn't happen. I worked for Peter Fonda, I worked for Orion Pictures, but again, I was so far away from production that it, it didn't even seem like I was working in it. And uh, so I went back to work in politics in the last campaign I did was Bill Clinton's, and I was waiting for Leon Panetta, who was then a California resident, to run for governor. And friends of mine that I had made along the way in the entertainment industry were working as location managers. And they said, it's the same thing as politics. You walk around, you beg people for favors, you plead, with, you plead your case, but mainly you're doing a lot of talking and ingratiating yourself and hoping they don't slam the door. So I started out doing that, and Leon Panetta um, didn't run for governor because a little thing like the Monica Lewinsky scandal broke out. He was busy. Um, <laughs> you never know where life's going to take you. Um, and I went to work doing signatures for my friends that were location managers. That means if you go extended hours after 10 or you're going to be on a location for too long, for like three, four days, you have to get the neighbors to sign. It was very glamorous. You have to get the neighbors to sign a piece of paper saying that they won't kill you or report you to the city council. I did that for a while, and fortunately I helped a location manager out in a big way getting signatures for him that I, I, he never thought I would get. And I have to tell you, it's quite a difference when you go from being a deputy political director to the lowest rung of the ladder. You think, what am I doing here starting all over again? But it was fun, and there weren't any other good campaigns or candidates coming along, and I thought, Temporarily, it would be a great job. So I did signatures, and then someone said to me, would you, you did a great job on signatures. You obviously can talk your way in and out of things. Would you like to come in? I'll get you into the union, which is not so easy. It's very hard. It's a, it's a, you know, a favor. Well, can I get you into the union? Because there's a long list, and they do try to keep it closed so that all of us do work especially with so much production leaving L.A. and the California, Southern California area, they do try to keep it closed. I got into the, I got into, uh, the union and I started on a show called The Visitors. Um, it was 11 and off. It was 11 episodes and off. But the first thing that struck me, having come from democratic politics and going to school in Washington, D.C., was this is the whitest group of people I've ever worked with. It was the show called The Visitor, and they had wonderful producers. Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich are two of the nicest people you can work for. But the set was all white. And it struck, and I'd say something to people, and they said, every set is all white. Where have you been? And I, then I went on to do a show called, then I went on to do a Cuba Gooding movie called A Murder of Crows. And he's, he's a gentleman's gentleman. He's one of the nicest actors I've ever worked for. 
But here you had the star of the movie, an African-American. It was right after Jerry Maguire, so he was the hottest ticket in town. Every location I went into said, show me the money, and it was <laughs> um, But there was Cuba, his assistant, and his makeup artist, and they were the only African-Americans on that crew. And again, I thought, this is crazy. I mean, I'm in some sort of surrealistic Hollywood. The liberal Hollywood is not hiring people of color. I couldn't understand. And often there would be um, actors, actresses, directors, Michael Schultz, Paris Barclay. They were wonderful directors. It didn't go below the line. And then I had a wonderful experience. I went to work for a producer named David E. Kelly, who did Chicago Hope and L.A. Law and Picket Fences and Ally McBeal and his best show, The Practice, that I worked on, and Boston Legal and a whole host of other um, shows. And I went onto the set the first day and I was surprised and pleased. It was the most diverse crew I have ever seen. It was one of the few, and, and this goes back to 1997, and it's still one of the few. But I see it more and more. I, as a woman, I know I always make it a, 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 well, let me back up a little bit. So I went to work for David Kelly, and I started going into these communities and uh, going, knocking on mansion doors and saying, would you please let us film here? And of course it was David Kelly, and it was a practice, and it was a prestigious show. They said, sure. And then they'd say to me, well, what location service should we go with because we'd like more filming? A location service is an agent for inanimate objects. There's an agent for everybody in this town. <laughs> um, they represent commercial and residential properties for use in film and television and commercials. And I went to the producer and I said, all these great homes that we have to go back to want to be represented. He said, start a service. I said, I'm not a business person. I do politics. I do you know, uh, entertainment, but a business, for, you know, that's Donald Trump. That's not, you know, that's horrible, capitalism. Um, <laughs> I'm a liberal, I can't help it. Um, but he said, start it and protect the properties for the different David Kelly shows. I'll waive, I will waive the conflict of interest because you're not supposed to make money from doing something for the show. And I bowed out of every time one of my show, one of the Kelly shows in one of my locations. I waived my commission. And I started with 12 houses in a, in a gated part of Hancock Park in LA called Fremont Place. And I now represent 150 properties. And unfortunately, do, no longer do locations. Before I left, I did some great shows. I did The West Wing. I did a movie called Imposter. I did a mini series called The 60s. And the one thing I can tell you is the crews are not very diverse. And I, I still see it when people come to shoot my locations now, it is, it's an embarrassment, Hollywood should be embarrassed because we lag be behind the rest of the nation. Democratic campaigns are integrated, everything is integrated. Hollywood, you know, every, every right-wing wackadoodle <laughs> says, you know, liberal Hollywood. And if they saw our crews and came on to set, they'd be astounded. We desperately need you to succeed because we are pathetic about this. Mm -hmm. So now I have my own location service. I represent 150 properties. And people like Dave, uh, David come to me and say, listen, I need this house. Or I need Los Angeles Community College where I met Dr. Moore. <laughs> um, can you get it? And I represent those properties. And I negotiate the deal. And it's, it's hard work. You know, when you get on set, you're on set for 14, 16 hours. And it's a lot of work, and it's also a lot of painful standing around. And, uh, you know, when I did locations, it's a lot of physical work, which yeah. I was not used to coming it's, from politics. It's not supposed to be, but we're kind of a catch-all. It is. But, again, I am so pleased and, and thankful to be at this program because every college should be reaching out. Mm. There is a desperate need to get minorities involved in this industry. There's a desperate need to get diversity in, in all facets of Hollywood. But thank you all for inviting me down here, and I look forward to your questions. You can tell they're such a shy group. Um, Claire is going to be walking us questions uh, this way, and I don't know if people have questions that they have. Pass them, pass them you know, that in or to Claire, or that in to Lori, if you have questions. 
May I make a request? Mm -hmm. Y'all yes. have water bottles right in front of your face, and I'm not getting the beautiful shots of light. Thank you. Oh, you know that. <laughs> 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 there we go. I'll start with the first one as I kind of organize it. Um, can any, and raise your hand who wants to answer, uh, can you share what was probably the funniest thing that ever happened to you in this, in this business? Either the funniest or the most shocking, you can pick. Time. Yeah, I have, a, I have an interesting story. Okay. Um, it was my first film. Uh, it had been five years in LA before I got my first shot at anything that was significant. And that film was Salvador, which turned out to be uh, an Oscar uh, nominated film and uh, written and directed by Oliver Stone, starring James Woods, who was also nominated for an Oscar. The casting breakdown on that film was for a huge, threatening African-American guy. I'm Creole, African-American, Cuban. I think over the last three months I've read for more Mexican roles. <laughs> you know, and I never get them because I'm not quite Mexican enough. You know, I don't know, but more Puerto Rican and Cuban. But anyway, it was for a huge, threatening African-American guy. And uh, at the time I had hair. And uh, it was curly and wavy, and I looked even more Mexican and Latin, you know. And uh, I was sitting in the hallway with about maybe five huge, dark, big African-American actors who I'd recognized from things before. Like I said, this was my first shot. And uh, Oliver Stone had been to lunch with James Woods and the casting director, Bob Morales. Bob, I know Bob. Okay who also cast Platoon. And uh, all of a sudden they come in and Oliver Stone walks in after lunch and James Woods and Bob Marone is the casting director and Oliver Stone stops and he looks at these four or five huge big black guys and then he looks at my small Latin looking self and he goes, uh, uh, who are you? Uh, what are you? You're not black. You know, and, and so I had an attitude with my guy. I was like, you know, what the hell you mean I'm not black? Actually, it was, it was worse than that, but we're not going to go there. Um, so what the hell you mean I'm not black? What do you know about being black? I don't need this crap. I'm out of here. And he go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know James Woods? I go, yeah, I know James Woods. We go to lunch every day. What's with you, man? Sometimes, I didn't know who Oliver, I didn't know who Oliver Stone was. Sometimes ignorance can actually work for you, you know? Because if you know too much, you're a little bit inhibited and you, you get nervous. But I don't really know who Oliver Stone was. So I'm out of here, man. He goes, whoa, 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 I tell you what, whoa, come in, come in the office. So I follow up, follow to Oliver Stone, James Woods, and Bob Monroe as the casting director, and through the office. Oliver closed the door and he says, look, I want you to do an improvisation. Uh, I want you to walk outside, come back in the office, I want you to walk in, and I want you to convince me that you can get in James Woods' face, you know, and throw him out of his apartment. Lo and behold, you know, I not long ago, you know, I was that guy that was throwing guys, not necessarily out of a party, okay? So, um, anyway, I said, okay, I go outside the office, I close the door, I knock on the door, and I'm like, the whole entire office, everybody's peeping their, their heads, peeping their heads out, like, what, what, what's the noise? I'm really going for it, a problem. So, James Woods, he opened, um, I just, Break into Oliver Stone's office. James Woods is sitting on the couch and he, we're doing this improv and he gets up and he tries to get up and I had on cowboy boots at the time and I put my foot in his chest and put him back down on the couch and he started shaking. I was on and man and we just went on and on and on and I was in his grill, you know? And all of a sudden Oliver Stone's like, whoa, 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 okay, that's it, whoa, 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 whoa. Sit down. You got the part. That very rarely happens when you, when you, when you, that very rarely happens when you actually get cast on the spot, right? Now, those five big black guys were laughing at me the entire time, you know, because I'm a small, peppy, Le Pew looking guy there, right? 
So Oliver says, he says, look, you got the role, but do me a favor. Don't say anything to these guys when you walk out, okay? Because I still got to read them. I said, okay. I walked out of the office. I looked at him and said, uh, you mother can go home. The role's mine. <laughs> True story. Yeah, it's funny. I, I work in comedy, so you'd think I'd have a ton of them. Um, but the ones that I remember was auditioning is so absurd for anyone of color in Hollywood. Because most of the roles are not written by anyone of color. So I would do stuff and go, I cannot believe how badly written this is. And they were convinced it was brilliant. And so I remember uh, I would come in for auditions when I first started in, in Hollywood. And I, I got a, a lot of, I actually was pretty much a working actor. I mean, I, I did really well. I was buying artwork. And uh, <laughs> like, I remember now, I'm like, how do I buy artwork? I was like, but back then it was a little different. So I remember uh, auditioning for General Hospital. I, I was a summer storyline, which is the, you're the lead for the summer. And, was, and the role was Juan from the Biscayne Islands. And I'm like, wow. there is no Biscayne Islands in Latin America. <laughs> and the person goes, uh, you know, I come in there, I just did for General Hospital, and here I'm, I was like, I, I, I was a class, I was at La Jolla Playhouse, I was a lead at, in there, and I got, you know, Time Magazine's 10 best productions of the year, really good stuff. And so I was thinking more, I was, I was a serious actor, but I would tell my, my agent all the time, look, I don't want to go off with these gang roles. Gang roles just wrong. I, don't want to do, I just don't want to do it anymore. But then when my bank account would get low, I'd go, yeah, I can do a gang member. Uh, and so they called him General Hospital, and I was happy. Oh, man, I'm not going to be a gang banger, gang guy, mafia guy. I'm going to be a revolutionary for the Biscayne Islands. <laughs> so at that time, I mean, it was way back when. And I, so I go, OK, come in there. And the casting director looks at me, very white guy, and I just, he's like, well, okay, Rick, it's Juan from the Biscayne Islands. <laughs> it's in El Salvador. I'm like, there's no Biscayne Islands in El Salvador. <laughs> and he goes, so I start, I says, well, just, just start reading. I'm like, All right. So I'm like, Monica, please help my people. <laughs> I have come here from the Biscayne Islands <laughs> as a revolutionary. I had to swim over miles of water to go to Port Charles, shark infested water. And there were dogs. I heard the dogs, always the dogs, because I came here. Yeah, I was like, this is the real dialogue. I'm telling you, this is the real dialogue. It's like, why ask a lot of life? And then I saw, hey, hey, hold on. Hold on, Rick. Is it Ricardo? <laughs> First of all, it's really Rick. My parents named me Rick. It's not Ricardo. It's not like I'm ashamed of Ricardo. It's Rick. Okay, so, okay, okay. Rick, that. Um, you're doing a, uh, a Mexican accent. I need an El Salvadorian accent. <laughs> so I went, oh, okay, you're, you're absolutely right. Let me, uh, hold, just give me a second. Monica, please. <laughs> I had swam here from, you know, exact same accent. And he goes, oh my god, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the Salvadorian accent. That's better. Okay. And I, I was like, and I'm running all the time. You, you, you go out for, for roles. And, and it was just plain absurd. That's what drove me to writing. Because I would, I would do these, these, these just crazy roles. Like, when I first came to town, I was, I was right out of ACT, it was a master's program. So I went to a master's program, and uh, I was on a full scholarship because basically I told them I'm not going to pay for this. Um, because I thought ACT was the whitest place in the world, it really is. ACT was the whitest theater of all time. They taught standard American speech. There is no place called standard America. <laughs> so you talk like this, you could have a stirring, the singer's idea cup. But I'm like, man, I got from that to Monica Lisa. <laughs> so it was, it was just the whole thing was absurd. So um, I, I would I would get roles. So another one was I, I got to get uh, Columbo. Because so, the acting part's the fun part. So I'll tell you, it's fun. So I'm playing Columbo. I come into Columbo. And they're like, uh, we really want you to audition. And so I auditioned for Columbo as, uh, with George Hamilton. And of course, uh, 
I didn't get, I, I, they don't even want me. I walk in and I'm like, you know, trying to be a serious guy, and I'm, because it says you're an assistant. So no problem. Come in, hey, uh, boss, I'm your assistant, and I'm talking this way. Yeah. No, it's a Mexican assistant. <laughs> So I go, okay, boss, how are you? And so, <laughs> and so I, they, the, the guy just kicks me out, basically. And so my agent calls him. He goes, uh, hey, listen, a month later, he goes, they really want you to come back. And I go, fantastic. Is this a callback? He says, no, they hated you. <laughs> but they don't realize that you came in before. So why don't you come back? but look differently. <laughs> so, it's George Hamilton. So I put on Clown Brown number five. That was the darkest makeup I've ever worn. I looked like a moor, you know. It was so dark. So I come back, and the guys, you know, I come back and it's like, Hi, I'm George Hamilton's assistant. I'd like to be here. I get the job. <laughs> Good job. Show up on the set, and now I've got my regular skin on. And so, of course, the director's like, oh my god, what happened? Where, 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 where? Like, Don't worry, they just darken my skin. So I, I would do that, and I would get these roles where I would darken my skin, a few thousand things, and it was absurd. That's what got me to write. Mm -hmm. I went, I went, at least if, I'm going to create my own stereotype, you know, and, and <laughs> do those kind of things. Because the, the writer's room is the one it changes everything in Hollywood. You know, it really does. But the writer's room, statistically, because I'm a member of the writer's deal, it's a very white room. It's the whitest place of all time. It is like going in there is, is a, I, I get blind. It's just all these white, translucent <laughs> dudes there. And it's not a lot of women, that's for sure. So women aren't there. So I, I, well, I, I look at a white woman and go, I understand you. Thank you. <laughs> well, you're one of us. And, because there's not many women there, there's, there's almost no people of color. I was on an airplane with three Latino writers. One was Jose Lopez, who wrote Real Women at the Curves. There was me and another writer who did uh, 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 La Misma And uh, I looked around, and I turned on the plane, and I said, if this plane goes down, half of all the writers, <laughs> Latino writers, are dead. <laughs> have to, I don't know what's going to happen. So that was my funny story, just in that world and, and seeing that was absurd and that's what drove it right. Ashley, this is for Tiffany. How would I be able to get my developed series to you at CBS? <laughs> that's the number one question I get. Out of First of all, you wouldn't. Legally, I can't accept that. Right. So that's number one. Um, what you would need, it, the, it's one of those questions, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, in the sense of if you have this fabulous pilot, even if he wrote it, yeah. if I wrote my own, I can't walk it in. You do need representation, and you do need an agent, a manager, a lawyer, and I would suggest that for anyone that's developing anything, because it, you need to protect yourself. So yeah, they'll, they'll take it. Yeah, they'll take it and claim <laughs> okay. it as their own, and you know, because I mean, think about it. How many CSIs do we have on the the air? How many NCISs? You know, but yeah. it's not original ideas very often. Just couldn't be CSI Oxnard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the next question is, well, how do I secure representation? And that one of the reasons why I was talking about either um, any of the programs that Rick went through, Warner Brothers. Every network has them. It's not just CBS, NBC, ABC, et cetera, et cetera. Really being able to build those relationships because that's what's going to help you within this industry is relationships. And so whoever asked the question, who asked it? Where, who, who are you? Who asked it? Sir? Yeah. Um, you would really need to, I would recommend, if you, if you have a pilot, so obviously you're a writer, correct? Correct. Okay, so you would need to, I would say, get into any of these particular programs because all of them, 90% of them, once they come out of the program, they all have representation. And so that's what you'll need in order to get it in the door, in order to pitch it in front of development. So you need to do your homework and get on that internet and show, start, and all of the networks have different deadlines, but for sure, that's the number one question. Like, I have this great idea. It's like, great, tell it, you know, find it to an agent and your lawyer and get it, um, make sure it's registered as well. Thank you. And, and I think it's important, correct me if I'm wrong, not only register, anyone can register with the Writers Guild of America, you don't have to be a member, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but also, Library of Congress is very important. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yes, but make sure you check out those programs. They're invaluable. And also are the relationships that you'll build from them. And if you're a writer, I hope you're writing. It better be absolutely amazing. <laughs> and please, this is the other thing, one thing, because I oversee our writer's program. I can't tell you how many damn scripts I read with typos in them. What the <laughs> hell? Yeah. And it's tender. You know what I mean? Like we said, oh, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. If you can't get that, what makes me think that if you can't even write a script that has damn typos in it, <laughs> that you're going to be able to carry a show? Right. We have a graphic novel that's already out there. Uh -huh. So we so we'll take that idea and move forward. All right. Uh, and it's typo. Perfect. <laughs> you know, you know, I, I write also what a lot of writers don't get, you know, up and coming writers is how meticulous you have to be about things like that, typos. No matter how great it is in terms of dialogue or story, it'll just completely turn folk off. Am I right? They come in and they're a little bit lower budgets and they're webisodes. And I thought, okay, this this will catch on. And then the following season People came looking for locations, and we just shot two at Los Angeles City College, college commercials for webisodes. So there, there's a whole new field out there opening up. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's less money, but yeah. it is yeah. a funny thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's called a long tail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in addition, I uh, Google um, uh, invested $100 million into YouTube last year in order to develop original theatrical programming. Um, webisodes, short films. I'm starring in one of them. And because of the first folk that they went to were huge people, Rodrigo Garcia and John yeah, Abnett. Yeah. So if you look at all the, the Wigs projects, you know, one of those I'm starring in ongoing. And we don't make a lot of money. That, that's another thing. I think our union needs to negotiate. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, all, the, all the unions are working yeah. on that one. Yeah. That's the next yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we work very hard, just as hard on, on anything else. But the game is changing, like they said, in terms of uh, webisodes and so forth. The other thing I want to say, too, is that you're right. Just being an actor is not enough anymore. I started seriously writing about maybe 12, 13 years ago because there were two major films where I was down to the wire between me and the other guy for the leads. And it would have been a game changer. And it always went to the other guy. So I'm saying, what can I do to not, it, it's not going to guarantee to change anything, but what can I do to take the reins in my hands? So I started seriously writing and I got into a workshop with two top writers who became pals and mentors of mine, Jim Ools, who wrote Fight Club, and Blake Harrod, who wrote The First Born Identity. And I'm always working with these guys, and they always go, I don't have this lecture, but I always let them go over my, my project and tell me what they think. It, you know, is wrong because there's always going to be there's no perfect script. You know what I mean? So you know, being an actor uh, is, is like I said, is not enough anymore. And I wish I would have realized that 20 years ago that it's called show business. You know, but every actor wants to be hired and be that guy, and and your approach just has, has to be uh, just entirely different. Obviously, my friend here was ahead of that curve. A long well, time ago. I, I mean, I looked at it and I remember it was, there really wasn't hardly any jobs for Latinos. I mean, it was just, you know, it was, and, and the truth was, I was, I could do gangbanger roles or mafioso guys and all that stuff. I just would personally in the back of my mind go, my head go, you're lying. You're lying. <laughs> you're not a gangbanger. So, in fact, I was, on a team, I was on a film set and um, it was a wonderful film. Uh, called Ghetto Blast, you gotta buy it. Um, and it started, <laughs> so I come to it. Now, I, I'm Mexican, so I grew up, you know, I, I, know, I, I know the world. Now it's like, I'm shooting in white fans territory, which is a real bad gang in, in East LA. And there's, you know, Frog Town, I know, I know all the gangs, so I, I go there. And, so I'm playing a gang banger. I'm, I was a lieutenant in the gang. I wasn't the head guy, but I was like middle manager. So, um, he explained it to me. So, I'm out there, and I'm like, you know, looking like a gang member. And I'm like, hey, what's up? You know, I'm telling these people that don't ever come in my hood again. And they, you know, they cut, and I hear this, hey, man, he ain't no gang banger. <laughs> that fool no gang banger. Look at him, man. I never seen this fool around here anyway. He ain't no gang banger. <laughs> so, on, on, I look up on a, on a, a garage, right where I'm 
started shooting, there's like 15 white fence gang members. <laughs> and they're lifting their shirts, showing their tats, white fence and stuff like that. I turn to the black security guard and I go, hey, is there gonna be any trouble? <laughs> <laughs> he says, if there is, it's all on you. <laughs> I'm making minimal wage. I'm <laughs> I'm now, I'm now outnumbered in white fence territory, playing a game, and I, that's the stuff. So I go, I go, hey, you guys want to take a picture with me? Okay. Yeah, horns, we do, yeah. <laughs> and they turned into like little kids. It was really amazing to see that, that how much they love Hollywood. And so I started hanging out with these guys, and at one point, we we're doing the show, and I was, my car was in the, in the, in the shop, and I go, hey, can anyone, I'm living in Pasadena, which is white. So I go, I'm living in Pasadena. Can anyone give me a ride to Pasadena? And every actor, no, no, I'm out on the west side. Or so I hear this, hey, we'll give you a ride. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, go, I go, I look over, sure enough, it's the white fence guys. Hey, man, we'll give you a ride, homie. Don't you worry about it. We'll, we'll get you a Pasadena hotel, man. South Pasadena. <laughs> yeah, it's there. So, but now I'm embarrassed because I can't look at the no no gangbanger. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to get in the car with you guys at all. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, that's an embarrassing moment. I'm like, okay, sure. All right, give me a ride. These guys, give me a ride. There, there you go. Uh, I go, look. Uh, no drive through, no drive by, no drive anything. Just drive <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, you know, we'll take care of you, man. We really like you. You're a good guy. You know what I'm saying? It's your car. So they drove me home, and I was like, you know, and I was going through the, their angst as we go through different gang neighborhoods. <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, shit, man. It was, like, you know, it was like, I'm going now, I'm a gang member. And a <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, I did not know this area, so this homie got, the little puppet got shot here. <laughs> Amazing thing, but that's the absurdity of the Hollywood business. So that's great character study. Oh yeah, great, great character study. But that's you know one of the things that I I really looked at. And I said uh, you know you, you just can't be an actor. You got to be a writer. You got to be a producer. You got to be all of these things. You know I've been a, I was a, a vice president of LATV, which is a network. You know so many channels. And I was developing all stuff, and I put on some shows. I did homies, little puppets, little homie films. I don't know if you guys know this guy. You guys know homies? Yeah. 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 Of course. It's his Oxnard. Homies are an Oxnard. You know what I'm saying? Little homies. But I know this because I've lived that world where I've hung out with the guys and stuff. But what it tells me is you learn to be in Hollywood the great Gatsby because. You can hang out with the homies, you can hang out with the executives, you can hang out with all these different people because you're united and all of us are trying to work in Hollywood and everyone is scared of losing their job and everyone is scared of different things. So that's, that's my experience. Uh, this one, this question is for Adele. I'm happy Adele. I have a question for David and Marilyn. Adele, what are, are the requirements to enter into streetlights? Um, okay, streetlights. It's not easy to get into the Streetwise program because it's not easy to succeed in the entertainment industry. But the requirements are essentially you have to be an ethnic minority uh, and a young adult, 20 years old. You have to have a valid driver's license and um, be, you know, we take all different backgrounds at Streetwise. So, you know, we, people with four year college educations, people that have had incarcerations, people that have turned out of foster care, people that have come through junior college. Um, and it's a long application process, and really what happens is the ones that we can tell, because we can tell, um, are motivated and um, ambitious and know that working hard is going to be the answer to your dreams because once you get into the program, if you get accepted into the program, um, we are actually creating careers for folks. And they're below the line. You've heard the term below the line and above the line. And below the line careers are, um, as we've been talking about, they're very fulfilling and they can be well paying and very satisfying. 
part of the whole creative process. Um, so if anyone wants to apply, I'm happy to talk to, to each and every one of you individually if you want to, but it's just about being motivated. And the ones that hit the ground running um, do very well and grow into the careers that they want to have. Um, and so after you get into the training program, it's classroom training and it's on-the-job training and then it's job placement. And everybody talks about networking and who you know. And once you start, we start placing people on commercials. And the commercial sets and the advertising agencies are not very diverse either. No. Yeah. Um, and one of uh, our goals too is to get our PAs to meet the folks at the advertising agencies because there's nothing worse than seeing the um, black family in the white setting house, so they made a black family commercial. Um, and so we can, we're, we're trying to also infiltrate the advertising world too because there are writers and creators and producers and advertising agencies as well. And that, that's not gonna go away because ads, you see ads on the internet. You see ads in front of web series. So there's always gonna be advertising and there's always gonna be commercials. Thank you. Now this next one is for uh, David and Marilyn. You majored in something outside of television. How did you acquire the knowledge about the industry that you needed to break in Hollywood? Um, lost it, yes. Um, what I did, what you find in Hollywood, in the, what you call the below the line jobs, is in locations, I started out doing signatures. Everyone here is qualified to go out and do signatures. It's knocking on a door. It's explaining what the production company is going to do when they hit the street, your street in five days. And that's how you learn. It's amazing. Sometimes I'll, I'll catch myself talking to friends from politics and using all the jargon that I've learned in locations. And they, and they do say, how did you do it? There is nothing, nothing, there is no substitute for on-the-job training. You learn it as you go along. Um, I, I, we've had a lot of commercial pro production. I've had my business, this May will be 14 years, and it's scary how fast it went. Mm -hmm. But suddenly I was on, I was scouting with two production, two location managers one day, and they said, well, do you have room here for our moho? And it was a, it was a word I had never heard before. Mm -hmm. Finally, one of them was someone I'm friendly, I was friendly with, and I said, what's your moho? Now there's a new there's a new work, motorhome, which is, is peculiar to commercials. We don't have motorhomes in television or features. But that's how you learn it. You ask, and you kid around about it, and you hang out on set. There's a lot of hanging around on set, 12 and 14 and 16 hour days. I just had a location shoot at LA City College. The director was an actor, first time director. He's been in everything this summer, Joseph Gordon Levitt. He's in every movie out there, including Lincoln. I mean, he's, he's, this is his first film directing, low budget. He's working his ass off, um, calling in favors. He had Scarlett Johansson down there. He had Juliana Margulies working for free. But he realizes that it's time to get, in, get that other foot in and become a director. But you learn. You hang out on set. And that's how you learn. The, uh, the first job I had out here, I got from hanging out. I didn't really know anybody when I moved to L.A. I moved out here with an ex-girlfriend who was a terrible comedian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, a terrible ex-girlfriend? No, she was a good, good a great ex-girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but she had a group of friends out here already, and I just started meeting people at parties, and I kept meeting PAs, which is a production assistant, which is your traditional entry-level um, job. And I just, I talked to everyone, I said, hey, I really want to be a PA, if you ever hear of an opening, you know, someone calls in sick, someone's in a car crash on the way, whatever, call me, I'll come, I'll work for free. And that eventually happened, and my very first job I was sitting in a production office in the Hollywood Hills. I didn't realize that the person at the end of the table was a German director named Vin Vendors. 
Um, and if you're a fan of German art film, him and Werner Herzog are about the best. Um, and they needed a chicken for, for the scene. They needed a chicken to get out of a limo. Real, real pink piece. And they said, well, let's call an animal wrangler and get a, get a chicken. Well, an animal wrangler costs about $800 a day. And you need the Humane Society involved. And they'll bring you a chicken that can dance on a spinning record. We didn't need that. We just needed to get out of a limo. So they told me, go find us a chicken. And I'm new to the city. I don't know where to get a chicken. Uh, so I went to Chinatown, where was a of chicken <laughs> on the roof. And uh, there was this lady in front of me, who I later learned was from Jamaica, that was trying to buy a live chicken for a religious act <laughs> that involved Sataria. Yeah, the chicken wasn't going to be living at the end of her uh, ceremony. Uh, and the guy behind the counter was like, no, no, we can't sell a live chicken. And I believe that's mostly because of cockfighting rules in LA. They just won't, won't do that. And so then it's my turn, and I'm just like, hey, I'd like to get a live chicken, please. He said, no, we'll, we'll kill it for you. We'll give you, we'll give you a good dead chicken. Said, no, I need a live one. And I really, I had this fear that if I didn't come back with a live chicken, I was going to lose my job. And I took the guy by the shoulder and led him into the back room of his own store. And I said, listen, pal, I'm not a cop. I, I need this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get fired if I don't come back with a live chicken. And I offered him, I think the chicken cost eight bucks. I offered him 10, I offered him 20. I said, listen, I will give you $100 for this chicken. So I'm still staying in the production, 700 bucks. And finally, at the end of it, he said, all right, all right, what are you, what are you taking the, kid, the chicken in? And I had the foresight to bring my roommate's kitty carrier <laughs> with me. And he sold me the chicken for 10 bucks, and he said, don't ever come back here again. And I came back as a hero with a live chicken. And they saw the way I handled that problem, and they hired me on the next job they did, and the next job was paid. And then they hired me again, and then I met people on that that hired me, and you just kept moving forward, and pretty soon I was doing Mission Impossible movies, and I was on these $150 million sets. Yeah, Cameron Crowe, um, all, all kinds of, of people. But it's just about meeting people and getting your foot in the door. That's, that's the tough part, because you need someone else to do that, you have to you have to meet someone that will give you that opportunity. But after that, it's entirely up to you, because a lot of people get that opportunity and then just sit around and complain about fetching people coffee. Um, but it's it's challenging, and if, if you're up for it, it can be very rewarding. And like, fun, being PA is a fun job. It is, man. I, I miss those days. Right? <laughs> oh, driving an RV. Didn't have a care in the world. <laughs> it's also a 24, anything in the industry, and I, I know this goes to any one of the below the line jobs, it's a 24 hour job. Yeah. You, you've consulted yeah. your cell phone under the table five or six times since we sat down. It's not for the faint of heart. If you want a nine to five job with three weeks vacation, we are not the industry for you. If you want to retire with a gold watch after 25 years, we are not the industry for you. This is not for the faint-hearted. You have to have a real passion. You get the highs and the lows, but it's a wonderful career and very lucrative. And, and the interesting thing about it is your job is getting your next job. And so that's one thing you have to remember when you're getting into this industry is that everybody from PAs on up to the tops on commercial crews, they call it a freelance industry. And very few people have these full-time regular jobs. They're all finishing, and then as good as they did is going to depend on the, the next job that they get. So, and that's part of the fun, but it's also part of the tenacity you have to have in the industry. And be quick for the acting thing. Right. I always yeah. tell uh, students, uh, I also teach from time to time and coach on sets, and I always tell them coming actors, um, anybody out here want to be an actor? Okay. Now, how many want to be an actor? Okay, I always say that's not enough. It has to be that you have to act, not that you want to act. And that's going to make a difference. Actually, when I saw, this is how we, Hollywood's very good about judging. And I went, man, if you really want to be an actor, your hands should be like this. That's right. You know, because I just noticed that. Like, 
<laughs> and you never have job security. For a short time in between jobs, I worked as a, an assistant to Peter Fonda, Henry Jane Fonda, that family. And up until, even when he got the gig for Golden Pond, which was his last movie that Jane Fonda, his daughter, had produced, specifically because she wanted to work with him, he said, we, we were at the house one day, he said, you know, I was even worried about getting on Golden Pond, and that was after God knows how many Oscar nominees, nominations and an enormous career. People live from gig to gig in our business, and if you can't handle that, you shouldn't be in. This is not long-term job security. You're working to get work. That actually is really such a statement, because at least in perfect time to this question, how do you deal with failure? Uh. <laughs> I'm, I'm the biggest failure. I'd like to answer that one. Um, you know, it, my, I'll give you an advice that my father gave me. It was really beautiful. You know, he passed away, and I've always hung on to it. But I can't believe. When I first started the business, uh, my dad was a door-to-door -door pots and pan salesman when he was younger. And so, and he was a man who went to the Toastmasters to learn to speak. And so he said, you know, Rick, if you could speak beautifully, I'd be very proud of you. So I, that's how I got started with Shakespeare. I started reading Shakespeare every day, and, and I wanted to impress him. And I was in five kids in my house, so I had to do something to stand out. So uh, he said, I, I remember I started acting, and I, I, I auditioned for something, and I got it, and I, other, and I did get it for a while. It was like a little string of just, for some reason, it just wasn't working. I was, you know, you transition different times in your career. I was going from the young actor more of a, you know, an older actor, or vice versa. So he says, you know, Rick, I, every day I used to walk door to door and knock on doors, and I'd always hear no. They didn't buy my product, no, no. But after about 100 doors, I'd hear yes. You gotta knock on a lot of doors and hear no until you finally hear that one yes. I have a question for people, I'm sorry. I have a question, how many people ever heard of location management before tonight? That's a pretty good, pretty good amount. You can't be closed. If a door opens, take it. You can't, if you're a PA on set and, and you start hanging out with the location department, you start hanging out with sound, don't go in there saying, well, I'm gonna be the next Janusz Kaminski, I have to be a, a, a director of photography. You never know where that road could lead. When you're hanging out on set, there's a whole, there's a vast number of jobs that, that none of you know when you start out in the business. But being a PA, you, you hang out with someone like David, and they say, well, you know, Jesus, can you, can you put my cones down? Well, no, I, I went through the lights program, you know. Yeah. I did all that. No, I can't. Yeah, you can put down his cones, because he's worked with some of the best directors, for Terry Malick, for Cameron Crowe, and he has an apartment under him. And they all started out somewhere on set and David picked them up. So you have to be open. It's not always gonna to lead to the road of these gentlemen in front of the camera. Not everyone here is gonna go into directing and be, be a Steven Spielberg or be a Tom Hanks or, or a Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Stay open when you're on set. When you get that entry level job as a PA, listen, because there may be something that you're more qualified for. Hang out with that person. Get him to teach you a little bit more about what he does. You've got to want it. And you've got to want to be on set. And, and it's not about, it's, you have to ask yourself, what is the concept of failure? Over the last four weeks, and I've read for six major roles and six major projects, I did not get either one of them. Okay? Now, I'm going to go back to one of the first things I always ask my students when I do teach, I haven't done it in a couple years, is I ask, and I'll ask you, how many of you would like to be a star? If you were in my class, I would like I would ask you to immediately leave. Okay? Now, if I ask you how many in here would like to be the best possible actor that they could possibly be, I'm in love with you. Those who just raise your hands. That's what keeps me going because it's about the work. I know I'm a solid actor and 25 years later, I'm still evolving and growing. It's not about, you know, I think I'm all that, I have to be this guy and take myself seriously. I take my work seriously. You understand the difference? 
And I know because I didn't get the role, it's because I wasn't black enough, I was more Latin, or I wasn't tall enough, or this. It's got nothing to do with my work, because I'm working too hard. But in the end, that's the whole thing about knocking on a door. The rejection is so much a part of the business, mm -hmm. and it's so much, every aspect of the business is, is, is mostly failure. It's not, it's like, yes. it's not it, yeah, I mean, I, I just pitched a show for Cartoon Network, I pitched a show for Fox, um, coming with Adam Small, created, you know, Mad TV, and Living Color, a lot of shows, made a, a great showrunner in a lot of ways. We're pitching The Lionsgate. So I figure, I, I start to do the math in my head, out of all these pitches, something's gotta happen. You know, and that's really what it is. It's like for every resume you put up, for every person you meet, for every hand you shake, for everyone you, you do, it's a numbers game, eventually, it's got to go in your favor. And, and you'll see it every time, because I remember when I was acting, there was an actor who, who acted with me, and I auditioned four times with him, and I got every role. He didn't get any of those roles. So I show up at a, a, on a, um, a set, or, or another audition, for a role for this soap opera in suits in the East Coast. And he's like, oh, man, he sees him walk in the door, and I just saw his face go, oh, great. <laughs> Damn. Oh, man. He was actually a friend. And I, he goes, great, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get the role. And I really looked at him, and I said, no, logically and mathematically, I would imagine you're going to get the role. <laughs> because I beat you in four roles. So eventually, you're going to beat me. And mathematically, it's got to happen. And sure enough, you got the role. And, and you can't let the wind out of your cell when that happens. You'll sit in the room. I got a friend, Emilio Rivera. He's in this book. Oh, yeah, also. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a type was, he, yeah, he's a Latino lot. Right, he was yeah. in Con Air, yeah. you know. And every audition I go, Emilio walks in. I want to just get up and walk out, you know. Because I know he's hot. He's on Sons of Anarchy, you know. But I'll tell you a story about Emilio. We, we worked together early in his career. He got cast in the Latino Locks. And he's playing this kind of character I created. Kind of street guy. And as he's, uh, he's doing it, he's like, oh, damn, damn it. Oh, man, it's not coming to me. I have it. I got this role. And I say, Emilio, let me give you advice. That would scare the crap out of a white director right now. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not going to hire you. And they won't tell you why, because you will intimidate and scare them. I go, you got to be calmer. That's what I was explaining to him. And then now it's like, he's a son's of Anna, and all yeah, He's yeah. still a great guy. Yeah. But it's like, he was from the hood. He was in a gang. He, he's the guy that got me in this book. Yeah. Because we, oh. we knew our backgrounds when we did a con here. But the thing about it is this also. It's your concept of success. Rick is very successful. You know, I'm successful. I've starred in movies. I've guest starred in television. I've done a lot of work. But it's about, it's not as cliche as it sounds. It's not about the journey. I mean the destination. It's about embracing the journey. You can't start tripping about your destination or you want to be this. You got to enjoy the process of life of what you're doing and believe in it, you know? Um, no, I'm not Sam Jackson and, uh, you know, this ain't Benicio Del Toro. But, but you know, we're successful. It, you, know, it, 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 you know, and it's still a grind, even for those guys. Do you see this uh, documentary on Showtime called uh, That Guy and That Thing? No. I highly recommend that you guys see this documentary. And it's about these recognizable character actors that work all the time, have done 80 guest stars and all these films and still not stars or whatever. And one of the guys said, you know, he was asked, why you, what, 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 what do you think gets you a role? What do you think doesn't get you a role? He says, you know, <laughs> we're all human beings and the people casting, the gatekeepers and the directors and the producers. You know, you can go in and the guy says, I want this guy in my film because he reminds you of his brother. And then the other guy says, I don't want this guy in my film because he reminds you of his brother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no component. You just grind it out. Right. I, I think what everybody is saying here is that you can be financially successful, you could be successful without anybody knowing your name. You don't have to be Samuel L. Jackson. You can live in a wonderful home in Brentwood. You could have a great career. 
just be open to being it being a job. You can't say I'm going to stand up and win an Oscar, or I'm, I'm going to produce Steven Spielberg's next movie. You can have. Well, I think what what um, you and I spoke about the first time we met at Eric Garcetti's um, swearing in is convincing students, film students, that you can have good, financially successful careers and strong careers with a multitude of different different aspects of filming and production. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to be open to. If you keep the blinders on and say, I want to be Janusz Kaminski, and only shoot for Spielberg and, and all the great ones, um, you're not going to have a career as a cinematographer. But you can also be Billy Webb, who's worked the last nine years as the cinematographer on NCIS. He has a good, solid, very high-paying career with lovely residuals since that show is on in some market every hour, every day of, every, of the year. But, he, you, know, you know, nobody knows his name, but he has a wonderful career. You've got to be open to that. That's working in the entertainment industry. It's not always going up there for the Golden Globe, but it is a career and you're working in the industry. And, and you got to also define your idea of success, because tell the truth, if I ever hear people always tell me I'm successful, I never felt successful. Right. Never felt successful. I'm constantly like, how oh, that living color? Carrie was successful. <laughs> then again, I knew Jim when he was married with his wife, and I, I remember thinking they really seemed to be a happy couple, and they got divorced. Yeah. And so I see people, every side of someone, that it's like, it's, it's, success is a, is, a, is a very elusive thing for everybody. Yeah. And, and, and it continues to be, you have to kind of define what well, your success is. I know a producer named Robin Tate, he produced my show on Broadway, he produced John Lennon and he produced George Lopez. He basically he had the monopoly of all the Latinos. He lives in Cancun on an, on a, in a beautiful bay that they film all the Corona beer commercials at. He goes out scuba diving every day, and, he, and I look at him, and he's happily married. He's been with his wife for 30 years, and, and I think he's probably one of the most successful men I know. Mm -hmm. Because he lives in Cancun and still does everything he wants to do. Yeah. And he goes, you know, takes yeah. scuba diving in the morning and stuff like that, and you hang out with him. And, and I go, okay, that's, that's a, a definition of success for me. Um, I look, you know, I have children now. So children to me is my definition of success if, if they, they have a happy life. And that's that's well, enough for me. Bottom line is your dream is your dream and your journey is your journey. Big mistake for me to compare my journey to Rick's journey. Or vice versa, because he's in better shape than me. No, <laughs> and, and as you're climbing, as you're as you're climbing through your life and your career, the rejections you cannot take personally because of all yeah. the reasons that everyone was talking about. You remind somebody, so he wants to hire you. You remind somebody, so he doesn't want to hire you. It, not the decisions aren't personal. It, it is a business again. So you have to remember that so that you don't beat yourself up just because you didn't get that job. This next question is for Tiffany. Um, because you are representing CBS, how do you deal with um, the dynamic of when it's, is it diversity or then is it racism? Because you'll be in the room and if the skit goes really, really wrong, how do you approach trying to correct it? I think uh, a great example of that is there's a show on the air right now it's wildly successful and it has a huge executive producer attached to it. And I read the spec script for it a couple years ago and there's an Asian character in it and they wanted to call him Big Joke on it. And I think that comedies are the worst offenders whatsoever of being such stereotypical writing. It's lazy writing to me. It's a, you go for the cheap pop, as I would say. So you're going to give that kind of joke. And what, there was an Asian character and there was a joke saying, you know, oh, I can't pronounce my B's and you guys can't pronounce your R's, so we're just going to call you Rice. And I was devastated. I was like, I'm reading this in 2011? Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. um, I just thought it was really lazy. So I came home and I'm, why do I do this? And, you know, feeling real sorry for myself and it's not going to matter. I tell, you know, I was talking to my husband. I can't, I can vividly see him eating an apple. He's listening to me go on and on about this and how can this happen, blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and he said, he's shaking his head. He said, well, imagine if you weren't there. And he walked out of the room. And I was like, yeah, imagine if I, were, if I wasn't there. Because I have that power that when I walk in and say, hey, we can't say it. We just, you're not going to call him rice. We're not going to do X, Y, and Z. And they really respect that. And I have 
the power behind me of the president, our development people, that will eventually say, like, you just can't do that. So I think that, and now it's part of all of our business aspects where they automatically will come to them. And I was just on the phone driving here, and they were calling asking, hey, we have a uh, question about this script. Can we use this particular word? And obviously, I'm involved with all of our coalitions, the NAACP, the National Hispanic Media Coalition, the Asian, Asian Pacific Media Coalition, Native Americans, GLAAD, even Gina Davis's Gender, and, uh, Gender Institute in Media. So there's all of the coalitions that are my allies in this and, we can't, and can be used as resources. So I think that it's nice that I am there and I get to say something and I get to tell them when and when, and when they can't use, and it's not just terms, sometimes it's the context of a script. And I read every script that's on the air. So it's a lot of reading, it's a lot of work, um, and you get to know the, your executive producers. And then you, sometimes when you even, sometimes it's not even something that's racist, sometimes it's something that's overlooked, because nine times out of 10, it's not, no one's out to be malicious. No, you know, they're thinking they're, they're, they're funny, that's what this more so than anything. Um, one of our shows, How I Met Your Mother, the cast is all white. I can't do anything about that. That's, those are the best people for the roles. They got it, great, fabulous. However, they spend 90% of their time in a damn bar in New York, and the entire background was white. And when I mentioned that, it was just, again, the PAs, they're working very quickly. They hired their friends. They didn't even realize it. When I said to the executive producer, hey, did you realize they were? And they weren't even just white. They all had blonde hair. I mean, they weren't even like brown hair white people. <laughs> they didn't even realize that. And when I made the, I said, well, if they were all black, you would have noticed. <laughs> and then they just changed it. So but it's being able to do that. Was in, that was in 1990, 2000 season of the year. Yeah. Where, who, uh, Aaron Sorkin and Tommy Shalami are, are left wing politicos that, that are not racist at all. And they just looked at them one day and said, hey, fellas, did you notice your cast is all white? And that doesn't reflect Washington. And they hired an extraordinary act, theater actor, Delay Hill, who's, yeah. who's brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, but you just had, you had to call it to Aaron's yeah, attention. you just have to bring it up. You know, hey, the cast is all white. And Absolutely. even in that, it's like West Wing. That's my neighbor, John Wallace. He was the one who got me in it. And he was married to a Mexican woman. And so you go, John, you know. <laughs> and sometimes they'll go, oh, yeah, you're right. Oh. Mm -hmm. And, but it's also the allies. I mean, I look at, at Tiffany, and it's always, I, you know, I've known her for nine years now. Yeah. So I've always, I'm happy when Tiffany walks around. At least it's something I go, oh yeah, you know what I'm doing. She'll, she'll be catching going, because you're in that weird position where it's not that they really want to be rude about it, but even when you see it so obviously, you think, am I crazy? Am I the only one? I saw rules of engagement. Yeah. And I'm going like, it's New York. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, you can't go through New York and have the, the they don't exist. It's not the New York I've ever seen. And I, at one point, I watched Muslim Engagement, and, I'm, and I was, you know, shadowing it and seeing it, and, and, I, and I, it was odd to me. But there was one black man in the entire show, and he brought in a TV. And, I, and I, they're not malicious; they're good people. They're nice people. They just don't okay. know. Yeah. No, they're not thinking about it. Yeah. Like, like I said, I, I had the same problem with Friends. Well, Friends was yeah. pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I grew up. I grew up in Michigan, not in Detroit, not in Jackson, not in Flint. I grew up in a very white area of Michigan, and my couch was more diverse than theirs. Yeah. That, was, that was ridiculous. Yeah, I never understood that one. And people yeah. say like, "Oh, don't you love Friends?" I'm like, like, I've never seen who, one. Who's that? New York, man. Yeah. Boring white people. Yeah. Oh, no, that's you know. No Puerto Rico. Yeah. Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah. Friends, and like I said, you know, the cast is the cast. I get that. Yeah. They don't have a neighbor. They no, don't no, have no. a cousin. No, New Yorkers. They got no amigos. Not at all. But uh, 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 Rick keeps bringing up. Here's a story about John Wells, just to show you how, you know, when you have a dream and you believe. Over 20 years ago, John Wells was a little theater producer. The first play John Wells ever produced. Um, I was one. Of, I was in the cast. It was the West Coast premiere of a play called Bomb and Gilead uh, in West Hollywood. Was it no, it was at the um, Pan and Grass Theater okay. in West Hollywood on Santa Monica Boulevard. And John Wells was a little theater producer. It was the first thing that he had done. We ran for six months. Lamper Wilson, the playwright, huge playwright, wouldn't come out because he doesn't like to fly, you know. 
and that was John Wells' uh, and look at him now. Yeah. <laughs> how, how small the world is, how, it really, Hollywood is one of the We didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, but during that time, when I first came to town, uh, my impression of John Wells was this, I see her, he typed on a typewriter, that was 20 years ago. He was, I, would, you know, I would hear him all day long, because we were neighbors, and I just hear him typing all day long, and it was the biggest lesson I ever got, was that it's like, oh, I saw him. If you, if you want to be a writer, you got to write everything. Yeah, yeah. He did Lethal Weapon. Mm -hmm. I know him and I, I've worked with him. Um, so this is a typewriter. He just directed Iron Man 3. He still has this selective typewriter that he got when he got out of UCLA. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say one thing as far as like the diversity part is, it only takes just one person to say yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say yes. Um, I, I was complaining to, like, you go to... Write what you know. Sometimes people go to me and they're like, Rick, why do you write Latino? Stop doing it. It's, it's camping, you know? <laughs> I, I tell my wife, uh, no, I just can't say it. Uh, <laughs> no, what, what it is, is I go, when I, I'm asked that in interviews. I go, well, could you write this? Yeah, I can write a lot of different things. I really can. I, read, I did a Ponderosa episode. I did a, you know, Pax TV. One, I did a Dr. Quinn, I've done a lot of different things, but I do it because I need to make money. You know, if could Mark Twain have written anything anything other than how he wrote? I mean, why is he writing stories about the Mississippi? I mean, God, Mark, stop it. You know, and Dostoevsky, get keep talking about Russia, you're depressing the hell out of me. And it's like, you know, Eugene O'Neill got this dysfunctional family you keep talking about. I know you got one, but come on. And I think as a writer, you write what you know because Hollywood hires experts. Mm -hmm. And if a woman walks in and goes, um, an actress, a woman, funny writer came in today, and I get to work with her, and she's, and I sat there and said, wow, she's funny, I really like that. And if I was executive producing a show, and I said, I, it's, there's some women lead roles in this, and, and I'd bet to have women on that staff. It'd be ridiculous for me not to. Because they're going to help me look really good. Another trick in Hollywood is hire people smarter than you and surround yourself with them. A lot of people get that. Yeah, because yeah. I'm the first one to say, I could not do a PA job. If someone is a, could find a chicken, I would be, thank you. Because I don't know how to do that. But he does. That place isn't there anymore. Doesn't anymore. <laughs> I would have gone to a pet store, right? <laughs> but, I, but I don't think Rick is also saying if, if you want to cross over don't confine yourself to just writing anything ethnic because you're ethnic, you know, if that's what you influence. I mean, if, if you think, my thing is, is, as a writer, my influences are David Lynch and uh, Roman Polanski. That's because I've been a movie buff since I was like 12, you know? So it's like, watch movies, watch things if you want to write about other things and learn that so you can know it, like this man said. You know what's cool? Is in my career now, I started thinking about it. I've really had a chance to work with a lot of interesting people. And like, you know, because, you know, uh, Robert, uh, Eric Roberts, uh, you know, I remember seeing Eric Roberts as a kid, he's in, you know, fat, that train movie, and I totally admired the guy, totally admired. And I kept getting, when I was doing the diversity thing, one year I was getting these emails from Eric Roberts, going, hey, I like your work, I'd like to meet you someday, Eric Roberts. And so my wife said, Eric Roberts is writing that. It's not the real Eric Roberts. Oh. There's got to be some dude named Eric Roberts writing me. So I do the diversity show, and at the end of the show, we come out for a, a curtain call, and there's Eric Roberts in the front row reaching up, shaking my hand. And I'm like, oh my, because I've been emailing you. You don't email me back. I go, you're Eric Roberts? He goes, yeah, I emailed you. <laughs> and, you know, so uh, I got to know him. We kind of we did a couple projects with him, and, and it was great. And you, and you go, you're surrounded with such interesting, fascinating people. Your life is so much richer, and, it, it's, and you can't buy that, you know. And it's like, look, this, this woman knows so much about politics, and I, mean, I just did a political, you know. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I did Prop 38. I don't care what anyone says. I was behind Prop 38. I, was, I did the Latino part. Prop 38? Prop 38, yeah. Okay, we need to talk. Yeah. <laughs> but you know something? I learned a lot. And I was yeah. like, and all the guys in Sacramento, 
were total idiots. And I realized, you know, I learned a lot about the whole process, but I was fascinated by politics. Because poli politicians are fascinated by Hollywood. And Hollywood is fascinated incredible, by politics. Incredible, incredible marriage that has happened. And everybody in Washington, I know, wants my job. And where I work in politics, everybody in Hollywood yeah. wanted my job, so. Yeah. Okay, now that we are coming close to Rabiani's talk, I'm gonna take two more questions. But I, I want to go back to what they said before. Some of them will hang around and, and answer your questions. What I'm also gonna do is the questions that we did get a chance to answer. I'm going to write these up, type these up, send them out to you. You can respond back. And if you want to come up and see me and attach your name to the question, we will get it back to you. If you don't want to do that, you come up with a question later. You can email it to Claire. We'll forward it, get you your answer, get it back to you. So that would cover everybody, okay? So, and don't forget, Ty's going to be here signing books. So, another question is, what is important to learn? Yeah, that's as, much, yeah. as much as you can. And don't say... Well, that doesn't apply to me, because I see a lot of women in the office. I see women rips now, women gaffled now, women doing sound, jobs that even as, as recently as 15 years ago when I started in production, you never saw a woman on the lighting crew, you never saw a woman on the grip crew, you never saw a woman in sound or on camera. Don't let them say, you know, that's not for me, I'm a woman. What could I go, what could I go into? Can I go into casting? Can I go into locations? Can I do something like that? You've got to be the one to do it. If you want to do it, do it. Learn it. Go out and make it happen. What advice can you uh, give to an aspiring producer? Mm. Don't aspire to be a producer. Aspire to be anything else. And you might very well wind up as a producer. But I don't know anybody who started out aspiring to be a producer who wound up a producer. Yeah, they back into it. There's a lot of different roads that lead to producers. I know a lot of actors and writers become producers. Yeah. A lot of location managers become producers. I think Kathleen Kennedy might have been a producer. Uh, location manager. Bruce Margolis, who runs Fox, started out as a location manager. You can't start, everybody wants to run Fox or Warner Brothers or be the next Alan Horn or, you can't do it. That's not the way you do it. You start out with something attainable and you build and you build. It's like any other career. You can't go out and be the head of Cedar sinai Hospital tomorrow. You have to be an intern and then a resident and then head of a department and build that way. The same thing is applicable to Hollywood. You have to build towards being a producer. Yeah, I remember I told you about that actor that I took roles from. Uh, his name was, is Rick Tejas. Oh, I know Rick Tejas. Yeah, Rick Tejas was the guy I beat for all those roles. Rick Tejas was, like last year at the Unicorn, was vice president of Sci-Fi Channel. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he went from soap opera actor that I had beaten to him soap opera actor that he had beaten me to on and on, producer at MTV, and sci-fi. So, you know, all of us, you meet most people in the business, you, you, you have a range of things you do. So it's not like, I, I didn't start off saying, I want to be a writer. I didn't want to be a writer. Writer's a tough job. I'd much rather have people go, Mr. Nahara, we're ready for you on the set now. You want to talk Versus, what the hell, this crew sucks, are you kidding me? Oh my God! It's, you know, but you do every job you can because you need to make a living. And there are so many different producers. There are lots of different kinds of producers. So, you know, know the industry. Get on sets and learn all of it, and then find the path. One of the ways um, I've gone about it is through my writing. Uh, one of my major projects I developed in the Sundance Feature Project uh, at Sundance Institute. So I've taken that project as my lead project and I took that project uh, on the constituency, I mean, on the uh, contingency of that project getting produced by uh, individuals that I ran into in Germany that financed and stakeholders my little mom and pop production company. So now I have two or three other projects that we're writing and developing, and I'm doing it as an actor who writes, who's learning to produce through my little company independently. Then you take your project, you know, if it's worth anything, to the uh, 
uh, film markets. John Wells didn't start out as a great TV producer. He did right. ER and West Wing and Southland. He started out as a writer. Right. He pushed himself up. Through theater. Through theater. Yeah. And he started off as a writer. Yeah. Most, most people, one thing about theater was I, my first job was living color because I got the job. Is, is Keenan said, I heard you, you write a lot of theater. I go, yeah, I wrote a show called Latin's Anonymous. It's very funny. It's been around. And he goes, how did you do? And I go, you did a million in ticket sales? I go, a million? Damn. Okay. Now, money made him very interested in me. And I said, a million in ticket sales. And it, you'd be surprised what makes people interested. But the bigger thing is this education. Education is not necessarily a BA, and it can be. Education, it can be self-taught, self-learned, all these thousand things. You can come up to the business as a PA, and you get educated to be a producer and everything else. Many things that we do, there's no real school for it. Right. Yeah. Which reminds me, when I found out that Anthony Hopkins, one of the greatest actors on the planet, dropped out of what, seventh grade? <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's about your journey. Last question. Are you seeking any interns? Are some of the students who may be interested? Or, and if so, uh, how do they go about reaching out to you? Yes, yes, yes. If I get another intern from USC, I'm going to kill myself. It's <laughs> like we live in Los Angeles, but every, in every resume I get, USC, USC. It's like this USC, this much everyone else. Everyone, please go to cbscareers.com, and there's a fabulous internship program, not only here, New York, I mean, they're all over our local news stations, so yes, we are desperately, and these, because I run the internship program for the uh, communications department, but I oversee that program, and I don't see a lot specifically besides USC, really. They are, like what I talked about being relentless, mm -hmm. they are relentless. Those resumes are tight, they, I mean, and, you know, they, it's not that they're undeserving, it's just that the numbers that I receive of those resumes are unbelievable. And I don't get those for very little from community colleges, and I don't know why. Yes, you see, I, I look at it and I go, everyone needs an intern. Yes. Everybody everyone needs does. an intern. And we I'm, all know someone who needs someone. So even if, you know, our spots are, filled, and this is the other thing, in the summertime they're paid, and they pay well um, throughout the rest of the year. They are for credit, but I'm sure that you know people need school credit as well. But most of the summer internships, um, all of them are paid. So I really you think also got to be not afraid to ask because I know there's a cadet. We have a sheriff's department at LA City College. There's this cadet Karen who has helped me out by opening buildings and all that. Finally, she said, "I'd like to work for you. Can you train me to be in your business?" And so the other day we had 902. 90210 at, at LA City College for five days. She shadowed my site reps. She took the time off, and, she, and she's learning, and once I couldn't go down and do a tech scout, which is the scout before they actually come and shoot when you have 20 department heads, I said, Karen, are you available? Will you take notes? And I sent her a check, and she will, She said, I got my first paying job in the entertainment industry. That's a good feeling. You know what? Ask. You see somebody, eh, the work, what are they going to do? You know, we say in LA the second best answer is no, because at least it's an answer. you got to try. This, this is a girl who's going to LA City College. She's majoring in uh, law, police, whatever. Pre-law. No, it's not pre-law. It's uh, criminal, <laughs> criminal justice. She, she's a student there. She's also working as a sheriff's cadet. And she said, you know, I think I want the entertainment industry. What you do looks like fun. I, I told her how much fun it is. Um, but she did. She works very hard. She's always available. Whenever I need her, she makes herself available. She calls me and she said, OK, I have four days off. What can I do for you? you got to do that. Those it's are the people hard. that you remember. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. I mean, those are the ones that, you know, I give my card out. And I can't tell you how people don't call or email. And why do you ask for it then? Or <laughs> it's also, it's another thing. It's so easy. You can find any of us on the internet. Uh, yes. Really? Nobody like, has a life have, anymore. It's right there at your fingertips. Send an email. What, what do you have to lose on that? One other thing I want to quickly touch on is that we haven't discussed hair and makeup. I oh, signed right. so many hair and makeup bills that would kill you. Yeah. For someone who was bald, I signed a $3,500 check. 
because we used HD powder on them. Because everything's in HD now, so mm -hmm. now the hair and makeup artists are real slick because they have this HD powder that's really expensive. He's bald, <laughs> and I signed a check for $3,500. Charge $3,500 to touch you up. I mean, it's ridiculous. The hair and makeup, it's, it's huge. Yeah. Wardrobe, yeah. Yes. Wardrobe, yes. Hair and makeup, though. Hair. I, mean, I know there's a lot of people out there that know how to do hair. And those bills for, and this is every time you see anyone on any talk show. These, you know, these are just even the small things, not even just the show hair and makeup. Anytime you see them on Ellen, well, any of those shows, yeah, I 15, know, I know how much the ones that Ellen, my wife worked for Ellen, I know how much their hair and makeup people it's, make. It's outrageous, but it's a good check. Yeah. <laughs> and it, these these are all good checks. They're not Steven Spielberg right. money, but they're good checks that, that, that are much better, unfortunately, than teachers. Firemen, police, things, nurses, nurses, things that are nurses. Yeah. They're good careers. There's yeah. extras that make a living. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Human set dressing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like. Oh, yeah, so, I mean, there's just so much. Well, especially set the dressing like, There's so many that you yeah. just don't yeah. think about. And it's a lot. Yeah, you watch the credits of a movie, and all those people are getting a real nice check. Nice. <laughs> and they're getting benefits, and they're getting retirement. I mean, the things that you look for in a career. Yeah, I have a pension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never thought yeah. I had a pension. That's right. And, or medical benefits, or things that are really important. So he just got married. We were all in his wedding. He just had got married. I mean. Wake up, family, because Michelle, his wife, works in the industry. Yeah. David works in the industry. They are going to have a great life together. Two industry families, and yeah. it's all over the I'm, city. I'm 35 years old. I have a guitar collection. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And a beautiful way. Yeah. And Rick is shopping for both, so I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love those. Oh, 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 you can you can nod your friends yeah. together. Everybody can't see yeah. that. Yeah. Oh. Well, you know, for for me, a lot, a lot of it is is I, I look at the Writers Guild and and uh, I'm I'm constantly like going yes when I I make that enough to get the, the help. The help the yeah. Yeah. Right. That doesn't sound weird, but the motivator. You'll have a different motivation all your life as your as an artist and what you're doing now. And now my motivation is three children. You know, that's that's a motiv big motivating factor, you know. And Very some good. of our location managers get scholarships for their children through our union. All these crafts and guilds have unions with damn good benefits that negotiate your contract. These are really viable lives and careers. So yeah, we would all like to be Steven Spielberg, and I would have loved to produce the Jack Nicholson movie, but that's not going to happen. You have to want it. You have to be realistic and not say no to anything. And on that note, I would like to thank our panelists. Amen. Time. Before the before everyone disperses, I mean the panelists that is, and uh, Ty is is going to be signing some books here on the side, uh, and I know Adele is making herself available to answer questions, so we're going to snap a couple of photos, and any 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 of you are welcome to hang out and answer questions if you're available. Students I know will have it, and if you don't get your question answered, please call our office and and give us your name or way in which to contact you with your question. We'll make sure we get your answer. All right, thank you all very much.